Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Whether you're a local or a tourist, seeing cows out on pasture is a sure sign you're in Vermont. For a farmer, pasturing animals is less about the beauty and more about the bottom line. Raising animals on pasture is a good way to cut feed and machinery costs, but pasturing uses different skills that some farmers don't have or aren't willing to take the risk and try. That's where UVM Extension can help. UVM Extension works with farmers to think outside the box, or in this case, outside the barn. Across the fences, Keith Silva has a case in point. At Island Acres Farm in South Hero, the cow barn is empty. That's a change for a farm that's been in Steve Robinson's family since the 50s. Uh, when my father took over in 1959, he said there was 23 dairy farms in South Hero. Uh, there's four dairy farms left. Robinson has no plans to reduce that number any further. About 180 acres and 75 cows make up Island Acres Farm. Steve, Kelly, and their two sons run the farm. A few years ago, Robinson put up some fencing and started to pasture his dry cows, those cows not producing milk. And now he's going all in. Now, every cow dines al fresco. Before moving to this pasture-based system, Robinson grew corn to feed his cows. Dairy farmers grow corn because it's a good source of energy for producing milk. As a crop, corn is reliable. That is, until it isn't. It costs a lot of money to grow good corn. It also costs a lot of money to grow poor corn. I think it was six or seven years ago, we had lost a large corn crop and I'd made the decision that we couldn't rely on, on a corn crop. And so started talking about a pasture-based uh, dairy farm. Growing corn and growing grass is as different as, well, corn and grass. It's an easier transition for the cows than it is for the farmer. Uh, so you're having to teach an old dog new tricks. Getting off that corn thing is, is, has been the hardest, you know, because you get so many tons of feed from corn, you know, where you have to make it up by being a better manager with your pastures, a better manager with your hay crops. So uh, that's been the hardest part. And then just the not knowing, you know, there's so many unknowns in farming now. I mean, you just, you're just adding more to it. So. We started down there, we've been doing like you were talking about, um, moving just one fence over. To help him get his pastures in shape and mitigate risk, Robinson called an old friend who had taken a new job. I started actually working for the Robinsons in uh, 2008. I actually was milking here in the evenings and I worked here for a couple of years. Cheryl Cesario is a grazing specialist with UVM Extension. She says Robinson's decision to switch to a pasture-based dairy comes with a lot of risk. A farm like this, a very well-managed farm where, you know, you've been doing something a certain way for so long and it works, um, to then have to switch and do something different, I think is a huge leap just because it's a huge risk, especially years like 2018, right, where it's a challenging financial climate, so it's even a bigger risk to take and do something different. There's more to pasturing dairy cows than opening the barn doors. A pasture system is very dynamic because grasses grow at different rates over the grazing season. Mm -hmm. So when you're setting up an area for, say, a day of grazing, what that area, how it's sized in May is going to probably be different than how it's sized in July. And so things are shifting and that's what makes it kind of complex, you know, because there's so much changing within a pasture over the course of a season. Cesario serves as a consultant for farmers like Robinson who want to change how they manage their animals. She's also an on-site source for troubleshooting and goal setting. You know, sure, I can walk on anyone's farm and tell them what to do, but that's not really that useful. You know, the better thing is to get a sense, like, what's the goal? What is it you want to do? And, and kind of the why do you want to do this? And then we can work together to come up with the plan and say, okay, well, what acreage makes sense to incorporate? So that they're a part of the planning process. Then to be able to check in, you know, three or more times over the season to kind of make sure things are on track. Are they happy with it? And if they're not, how can, what can we do differently to make sure it's working? The proof the system works is in the milk. Cows have been out now a couple weeks on grass here. They're seeing an increase in production of about 200 pounds a day. So that's a really critical thing is when a farmer is adopting a new system, we don't want to see a 
drop in production, right? That doesn't make the farmer very happy. So we wanna see either the production maintained or potentially even increasing. It's finding the nutritional balance, okay, where before you bought the commodities, now we're trying to grow our own commodities and trying to balance that out to make sure the nutrition is right for the cows, uh, to make sure that it can produce milk. I think it's been uh, educational. It's been, uh, been a little tough at times, trying to come up with the amount of feed that it takes to uh, feed all the animals that we have. There's an aspect to Robinson's decision to put his cows on pasture that doesn't have much to do with the farm's bottom line and everything to do with living in Vermont. Somebody did a survey, there's 10,000 cars go by here a day. Everybody always asks, what would you do if you didn't farm? I was like, what would you do if I didn't farm? When you're looking at sustainability of a farm, right, we have financial sustainability and environmental sustainability. Then the last piece is the social element, and that's how are the farmers fitting into their community. I think the response from grazing has been really positive. They've gotten so many comments from people in the community, so we're really kind of filling that social aspect as well, which kind of gives us that bigger picture of sustainability. Heather Trombley runs Roots and Wings Daycare out of her home in South Hero. She grew up here and was glad to see the cows in her backyard. We were excited when we saw the fence going up and then we, uh, I sent a little message over and they said that, yeah, we're gonna be letting the cows out to graze and um, so it's been really nice to see them. We just try to be involved and you know friendly and conscientious of, either, of each other's families and um, it works out great. I think communication is definitely key with, with any neighbors. We like to look out the window and we get to see them outside and it's just part of growing up here in Vermont. Robinson is proud of the award he's received from the St. Albans Co-op as a distinguished quality member for 36 consecutive years. It's a testament to his family's farming legacy and his plan for the future. I'm trying to get this farm set up to where it would be easier to pass on. More than anything, that's been the the reason that I want to transition into this pasture is so it's it's a workable farm to where I'm not putting the burden on machinery uh, and everything on to the next generation. Island Acres Farm gives new meaning to the phrase being put out to pasture. For the Robinsons, being out to pasture is how this farm will run from now on. In South Hero, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. The UVM Extension Champlain Valley Crop, Soil and Pasture Team provides technical assistance to farmers. They also invite the general public to attend field demonstrations and other events to learn how farmers are protecting natural resources and contribute to the working landscape of Vermont. For more information, check out the website on your screen. The UVM Extension Champlain Valley Crop, Soil and Pasture Team provides technical assistance to farmers. They also invite the general public to attend field demonstrations and other events to learn how farmers are protecting natural resources and contribute to the working landscape of Vermont. For more information, check out the website on your screen. Our next segment takes a look at who and what is living in Vermont. Scientists at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies in Norwich are trying to document every living thing in Vermont. Rebecca Gollin reports on the Vermont Atlas of Life. I'm going to watch this for a second. It's already uploaded and it just says on the database, I saw something and it's the picture of it. Let's see if Ken McFarland has here. seen this plant before, but the name is not coming to mind. To get some help identifying it, McFarlane posted a couple of pictures to a database online called iNaturalist. There, several hundred amateur and professional naturalists from around the state and beyond can offer their opinions. He doesn't have to wait very long. Just a few seconds later, and he has an answer. So, one of the guys already answered me, Kyle Jones, is on the site. He says, it's poison parsnip. You were right. It's poison parsnip. Which McFarland and his colleague Chris Rimmer are conservation biologists with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, or VCE. They're demonstrating the crowdsourcing capabilities that support one of their biggest projects. The goal of the Vermont House of Life is to map out every living thing in Vermont and where it is. Wait, everything? Everything from fungus and lichens to, you know, birds flying over your head. I suppose if you're really into it, we could get into soil bacteria. That's why it's called the Vermont Atlas of Life. They really do mean 
everything. Oh, there's a honeybee. honeybee. Yeah. VCE has produced several comprehensive studies of different species in Vermont. Most recently, a revised edition of a breeding bird atlas, as well as a complete survey of the state's butterflies. Hundreds of volunteers work with the group to collect data and information on a wide variety of species. There's a tremendous diversity of people that are involved in our projects. Of course, many of them are interested naturalists, um, not just birders, because we're working on amphibians, we're working on bumblebees, we've worked on butterflies. So anybody with an interest in any aspect of natural history and wildlife is, is a candidate. And um, yeah, we've got people in their 80s and we've got people in their teens that are out there collecting data for us. The Atlas of Life won't be live online for a few more months. For now, contributors post their observations and photos to one of the associated databases, which will feed their information into the Atlas. Although VCE does have some projects that require special training, anyone who wants to can play a part. You could take a picture of something while you're hiking of a tree, a leaf of a tree. Say, you know, I think this is some kind of oak, but I'm not sure. And you could post it on there and, and you could just say, Here's a tree I saw, here's where I saw it, here's what it looks like because the photo's on there. Somebody help me out, what is this tree? And there's so many naturalists on there now that someone will see it and they'll say, oh, that's actually a white oak. That's pretty uncommon in that part of Vermont. Do you think it was planted or is it natural? And there'll be a little conversational ensue and some others might jump in on the conversation about that species. And so not only are you providing a record of that tree in that place at that time, but you're also able to learn um, a little bit more about that species, a little bit more how to identify them, just from everyone else joining in and helping you. The observations add up. Vermont eBird, where bird watchers can contribute their sightings, has over a million records, with more being added every day. These folks are feeding us information that we could never collect on our own on a large landscape scale. And at the same time, they're learning a great deal, they're becoming engaged in, in science and conservation on their own, they're becoming more informed stewards, they're becoming ambassadors for wildlife conservation in their own communities. So it's really a, a tremendous um, two-way street. I have about 2,500 on the iNaturalist observations and uh, about two-thirds of those are actually Vermont. Roy so Pilcher is one of those volunteers. Raised in Africa, Pilcher came to Vermont in the mid-60s, already an avid birder. And there's nothing like putting you in the moment when you're watching birds. I mean, the rest of the world really doesn't exist. When you've got your binocular on a warbler and you're trying to identify it or you're trying to uh, watch its behavior or see where it's nesting, re really the rest of the world doesn't exist. It's really, you, you connect yourself to something that's living and it's completely involving and uh, just takes you over completely. When Pilcher came to Vermont, he had to transfer his knowledge of African birds to the American birds he was now observing. What I did right away, I kept field notebooks, and luckily I had pretty good records, so when all this information became digitized with eBird, eButterfly, and iNaturalist, I had a lot of information which I was able to transfer. Another big thing you can do is you can explore data. So you can actually go on here and map out where birds are in Vermont and beyond. So maybe you want to know, hey, where are the state, where's the state bird been seen lately? Hermit thrush. You can go on here, type in hermit thrush, and get an instant up-to-date map of where all the hermit thrush sightings have been. When the Vermont Atlas of Life is fully up and running, it will be an online clearinghouse of information for students, educators, naturalists, and others, as well as a place to share their own observations. In addition, as people around the state contribute their real-time findings and long-time naturalists like Pilcher add their data, the scientists at the VCE will gain a clearer idea of what changes are taking place in Vermont. As time marches on, are things changing? Are um, red oak trees moving further north? Are white pines moving and sugar maples moving higher in elevation? Um, are birds changing the date they arrive? 
Are butterflies changing their flight times? I mean, this phenology, this timing of things is really important, and that's only by observing it over and over and over every year. So even putting in every single you know, monarch butterfly you see in there helps solve that phenology, that timing issue. Is it changing? So it, it never is going to end. That's good news for a pilcher. I enjoy collecting data. I enjoy entering it, uh, both for the actual experience of the time, but the fact that that data is going to be used you know, down the centuries. Literally anybody can contribute a piece to help us put the puzzle together of biodiversity conservation in Vermont. And that's the beautiful thing about this. The Vermont Atlas of Life might never be finished, but the information it will provide will soon be helping to protect the state and everything that lives here. In White River Junction, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca, and thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Uh -huh.